Good morning, guys, and how you doing? Uh, welcome to Monday Morning, the first episode of your regularly scheduled Slags Tube programming, okay? Here we are at Triangle, uh, 8.40 a.m. I hope everybody had a nice uh, rise and shine this morning, right? Maybe eggs and bacon. Come on in and let's do what we got to, okay? So, uh, we can see March 30th here. Uh, today is an A day, um, if that matters at all, okay? I don't know. Maybe it does for you, all right? Uh, today is famous birthdays. We have Celine Dion, a uh, famous singer, um, the Titanic theme song, My Heart Will Go On, okay? Great stuff. She actually received the RIAA, the Recording Institute of America, uh, certified double diamond, one of the only songs to ever go that. It's uh, 200 million albums sold, so it's uh, a big deal, right? Um, I'm going to have a link below with some information on some of this stuff today. So you can check out some other links, some other YouTube stuff. You know, don't fall down the hole too deep. Try to dig yourself back out when it comes time to get the worksheets done, okay? Um, also, uh, Vincent van Gogh, uh, famous impressionist painter, was born in the Netherlands, actually uh, moved to France, didn't start painting until well into his 20s and uh, painted Starry Night. We're gonna have some clips below of uh, that French Impressionist movement, um, what that looks like, what it meant, um, where they moved on from there. But uh, Vincent van Gogh, probably most famous for slicing off his ear uh, and passing out in a brothel, uh, almost bleeding to death, but waking up the next day, uh, having a little bit of hearing deficiency, but most famous for cutting off his ear, unfortunately. Uh, moving right along, on this day in 1974 was the uh, some Chinese farmers were out there digging in the field, setting up like normal, and they stumbled upon the Terracotta Army, uh, which is a very famous, very amazing um, structure of the ancient world. 200 years BC, uh, the first Chinese emperor dies, and they plant uh, him in a tomb underground, and they guard him with these terracotta warriors. Terracotta, of course, uh, is clay that you uh, mix up right up out of the mud in the ground and you can build things out of it. We still build uh, pots to this day out of terracotta. It's that orangey reddish pot that you see um, sometimes planting in a greenhouse or before you move plant outside, planted in terracotta. So the terracotta warriors, there's 8,000 of them. And the really cool thing about the terracotta warriors is that each one is handcrafted and each one is slightly different, slightly unique. Some of them might have uh, more of a mustache, I don't know, like anyone you know. Some of them might have a full beard. Some of them are wearing hats, some are wearing helmets, some are wearing a ponytail, some are wearing their hair up, some are wearing their hair down, some are wearing their hair long, right? So just in the, the face, there's so many different variations. They're posed differently. Some are wearing armor, some are uh, playing instruments, some are holding things, some are not. So for 8,000 of them to be created all roughly the same height, they're all about five and a half feet tall. Um, it's just really amazing. And we're gonna put a clip below uh, for something along the lines of uh, a short discovery of the Terracotta Warriors. You can check that out. Uh, it's, it's very cool, it's very cool. I wouldn't, I wouldn't be so excited uh, this early in the morning if I didn't think it was actually cool, okay? Um, we are going to today take a look at a chapter of Pat Carmen's Things That Go Bump in the Night, 315, Volume 1. We're going to read the first story, okay? So the cool thing about this book, the cool thing about um, this series we've looked at uh, in the past, we've read Trackers a little bit, um, but the one before what you all enjoyed very much. So the cool thing about this book is that there's an introductory, okay, audio clip, and then we read the chapter, and then you go back to the website and put in the new password, and you get the video finale. So the story actually ends, the written story, ends in a cliffhanger, right? Which of course we all know is the climax of the story, right? The most exciting part in the story arc, it's like up here and then this happens and what happened, the story's over, the story's not over, right? But if you don't go below, you don't go to 315stories.com and put in the password and find out the conclusion, it's gonna be very unsatisfying for you. You're just gonna say, well, that was a stupid story. Why did it end there, right? So we're gonna go uh, to 315stories.com. There's a link below. They're gonna ask you for the password. Now the password for the audio file is Cody, C-O-D-Y, okay? So you're gonna put that in. I'll wait. And on pause. Hopefully you uh, enjoyed a little spooky, a little creepy introduction, right? And now, uh, we're going to go ahead and read the first story together, uh, Buried Treasure. We all have a copy of this. We've got the world-famous uh, 
Slides Frog holding my place here as a makeshift bookmark. We're going to get into this and we're going to go over some of the vocabulary after. Okay, so we're starting on page three. You want to follow along with your finger. You want to read out loud me. That's fine. Uh, you want to pause me completely or mute me and read it yourself out loud or to yourself. That's fine too. Uh, and for anyone who wants to do any combination of that, there we go. So we're starting on page three. Clarence Buchanan was born in the small town of Marshall, Wisconsin, all the way back when it was known as Bird's Ruin, which is to say a very long time ago. So long ago, in fact, that people around Marshall were amazed Clarence was still alive in the late autumn of 1941. It was a simpler time for a man of 91 to finally meet his maker. So we're starting off with the death. That's always exciting, right? They say Clarence was born of fire, and that's true enough. As a younger man, he sometimes talked about the blaze that tore through birds ruined the year he was born, how it gutted the tiny settlement and scattered most of those who survived to the wind. But Clarence had a willful, arrogant father, a man of the woods who was good with an ax and a shotgun. Marshall Buchanan kept his family on, taught young Clarence to fell the tallest trees and gun down rabbits, deer, moose, and bear, anything with four legs that moved and didn't bark or purr at the side of his leg. The town grew again, and Marshall Buchanan, who loved his ax more than any other tool he owned, tried to change the name from Bird's Ruin to Hatchetville which seemed to him a very manly name for a town. But to Marshall's bitter disappointment, Asahel Hanshet, an upstart business tycoon, tricked the mayor into something close to Hatchetville, but not quite, Hanshetville. After that, Marshall and his son moved out into the forest for good and entered Hanshetville only to trade chopped wood for supplies. It was about five years later when the accident occurred. Clarence should have known better he should have been more careful. He shouldn't have been anywhere near the clearing to begin with, but he was so excited he just ran and ran until he could hear his father's ax hitting a tree. They voted to change the name of the town once more, and Clarence carried the news. Marshall, Wisconsin, just like Marshall Buchanan. How sad that Marshall was also the name of a real estate broker who had purchased most of Hanchetville's assets and had renamed the town after himself. This was a fact that eluded young Clarence as he ran through the woods with the grand news that the town had finally honored Marshall Buchanan as a founding father. Clarence ran down the narrow valley just as a 150-foot tree came crashing towards the ground. He was 15 years old and fast, but not fast enough. His hand, the very hand he'd waved with a piece of paper that told of the good news, lay crushed beneath a boulder and a gigantic fallen tree. Marshall Buchanan's massive ax lay buried in the trunk as the boy's scream filled the fog-covered wood. No one saw Clarence or his dad for a long time after that. In fact, no one ever saw Marshall Buchanan again. Only Clarence appeared now and then with two horses and a rusted-out trailer full of wood he traded for flour, sugar, and oil. He never let anyone help him unload the cargo of fallen, cut trees. He did it by himself, hurling the sharp metal hook of his left hand into the heavy wood and putting his whole body into the effort. He was a huge man by then, bearded and tall and 250 pounds of woodsman. His small dark eyes watched the world and he nearly never spoke. The hook did the talking for him, or so it seemed, as he pointed it to a bag of rice or a pot of grease at the general store. And then one day the hook on Clarence Buchanan's hand changed. It is said that it happened after his father's death that Clarence melted the family fortune on the cast iron stove inside the hut in which they lived, that he fashioned an iron mold and poured the gold inside, that he made the golden hook and wore his treasure on his sleeve from that day forward. For a time, people saw the hook and wondered about it, whispering when it passed by. The big man with the golden hook, lumbering through town with his burlap bag of provisions thrown over one great shoulder, was a mystery no one fully understood. They could not have guessed how much the hook was worth because Clarence wore sleeves all the time and only the hook itself was ever seen by a living soul. Still, for a time, the golden hook gained quite a lot of notoriety. Years passed and Clarence grew ever more mysterious, visiting town less frequently until one day he stopped coming into town altogether. And so it was that many years later, when Clarence Buchanan was approaching his death, the golden hook 
had become more legend than fact. It had been largely forgotten in the preceding 20 years as Clarence became more and more of a hermit. Toward the end, very few people ever saw Clarence or the hook. At 91 and alone in the woods, there was but one person who'd seen him much lately, and that was Cody Miller, who we turn our attention to now. Cody Miller, a down-on-his-luck 17-year-old, had the unenviable task of delivering groceries to all the shut-ins around town. It had fallen to him in recent months to trudge all the way out into the woods and bring Clarence Buchanan what he needed on Friday afternoons. Whoever had done it before Cody had left town altogether, and the Golden Hook had drifted further still into legend. There was a short but meaningful conversation the first time Cody met Clarence Buchanan in the woods, which began like this. Me and the last guy had a deal. And what was that exactly? The deal had to do with getting ready to die, which Clarence Buchanan was busy doing when Cody came along. Cody Miller took notice of the desolate surroundings and the golden hook and decided he was fine helping the old man along. It was Cody who helped Clarence dig the hole. Cody who helped him build the wooden coffin out of slats torn from the hut the old man lived in most of his life. This here gold was my daddy's, Clarence said, when the hole was dug and the coffin was built, which amounted to seven Fridays for Cody. He held up the golden hook, the weight of which had trained that left arm into a hammer of incredible strength for 50 years or more. Even at 91, the arm and the hook could rip things apart when the need arose. This town ever ain't give me nothing or my daddy nothing. You best bury me with my treasure. Understand? Cody Miller nodded, staring into the dark eyes of a withered face. But in the blackest part of his heart lay a hidden secret he had told no one. He had a gold ring on his finger, a treasure of his own that had come into his possession by unsavory means. He turned the ring with the fingers of his other hand and bore down on an evil thought. No one will know. On that very day, Clarence Buchanan slumped over in a chair and breathed his last. The gold hook, still attached to Clarence, rested on a decrepit table next to the chair. Cody rolled the body into the wooden coffin that lay in the hole he'd helped dig. He heard the body of Clarence Buchanan land with the dull thud of death. He took time to lay the body out with care. Then he rolled up the sleeve on Clarence Buchanan's left arm. It was an arm no one but Clarence had set eyes on in a very, very long time. The treasure went up the arm farther than Cody could believe. Half a foot of gleaming gold, a fortune of serious value. It was held tight to Clarence Buchanan's skin by a wide leather belt, which Cody unstrapped with shaking hands. The fog had rolled in as night approached, just as it had on the day a hand was crushed so long ago. Cody couldn't be sure if he was shivering from the wet cold or from the fact that he was stealing treasure off a dead man's arm. As the golden hook came loose and Cody felt the full weight of its value, Clarence Buchanan's last words rang in his ears. You best bury me with my treasure, understand? Cody put the cover on the coffin. He nailed it shut. He spent the next hour filling in the dirt. When he was done, it was night in the woods, and a bitter cold had set in. He took up his treasure, heavy like a block of iron, and ran. When he arrived back home, Cody Miller prepared to melt the hook into a block of gold, pack his things, and leave the town of Marshall forever. We find him now at the makeshift stove, the hook on the floor next to him, the deed about to be done. All right, so here we are at the climax. Cody, down on his luck, having literally stolen the dead man's golden arm, just unstrapped it, taken it. His plan, bury him, make off with the arm, take it back to his stove, melt it down into a gold block, pack it all up, and head out of town. We'll get away with it. I actually don't know what happens. I haven't watched the video yet. 
I do want to hit the vocab before we take off. Some of the words in the story that we use today. Uh, they're up on the board. They're going to be down below. Arrogant, right? Someone who's arrogant. Uh, they might be conceited. They have a very high opinion of themselves, right? Maybe heavily inflated. Uh, I see you nodding your heads. We don't know anyone like that, okay? Uh, a tycoon is someone who does well in business, all right? Um, usually the name of the industry that they're in would be behind it, right? Um, Andrew Carnegie was a steel tycoon, okay? You could be, uh, there's a, that old video game, Roller Coaster Tycoon, right? Where you're building your own theme park. Cargo is my favorite joke of the day, right? Knock, knock. Cargo? Cargo who? Cargo beep beep, get out of the way. Great joke, right? Your moment of levity. Cargo, usually you hear it as the, the precious cargo, right? Precious cargo delivered. It's whatever you're transporting, uh, whether it's, uh, you know, you load up, you drop, drop, drop down the, the seat, you load up the back of the truck with your pair of golf clubs, there you go, now your, your golf clubs are the cargo, right? If you're bringing home the groceries, your groceries are the cargo. You're dropping the kids off at school, they're the precious cargo. Notoriety, okay, uh, coming from notorious, right? And a lot of these words have what's called a negative connotation, right? And we've gone over that. When you hear a word like notorious, it's not good, right? Your, your mind automatically thinks, oh, this is a bad word about a bad thing, right? That's negative connotation. So if someone is notorious, right, it means they're famous in a negative way or they're uh, well known for doing something sneaky or bad or wrong. Um, so if someone were famous from putting great videos on YouTube, right, you'd say, oh, that guy's popular, he's famous, he's an influencer, right? Now, if someone got famous from robbing banks and uh, shooting the teller on the way out, you'd say, oh, that's... That's a notorious person, right? Well-known, but for something negative. Um, hermit, also a word with connotation. A hermit is someone who chooses to live apart, right? Someone who chooses to live alone. A lot of times in the stories when we did the Arthurian legends, right? Uh, Arthur is at the stream watering his horse and he sees in the cave the old hermit, right? He comes out, he's got the long beard and the no clothes, the, the ripped up uh, rags and no shoes. And he's like, ah, I, 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 what's wrong? You know, right? They don't make any sense. They choose to live apart, okay? Uh, maybe you feel like a hermit right now having to be quarantined in because of the coronavirus, right? So a hermit is someone who chooses to live apart, okay? Unenviable, unenviable, all right? Again, we break it down, we look for the word envy, and we know that envy means, right, if you covet something or if you desire something that belongs to somebody else. Like, uh, Unique's got really awesome shoes on, I, I'm envious of him, right? I, 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 those, I want those shoes, they're really cool, and I have envy, and they say green with envy. Now, if something is unenviable, that means the opposite. I don't want it, okay? Uh, this morning, it's gray, it's overcast, it's raining, okay? I have the unenviable task of walking my dog right? He doesn't want to go. He doesn't want to be outside. He doesn't want to go when it's raining outside. And I have to stand out there with the leash like this, right? No one's lining up to take that job for me. It's an unenviable task. Desolate, okay? Uh, when I went to the grocery store yesterday, I drove past the park where normally there would be a bunch of people playing, but because of the quarantine, right, the park was desolate. There was nobody there, right? You could use it uh, if, if you were had a field and you're trying to grow your crops and nothing will grow in your field, you have a desolate field. So hopefully uh, you got everything planted and you do not have a desolate field. You have the opposite, right? Which is a healthy, thriving, sprouting field uh, in your planters, all right? So make sure to track that every day. The last word is unsavory, and that's another word with a negative connotation. And why, why are so many of these words bad words or spooky words? Well, because we're reading a, a spooky story, right? So you read a spooky story, it's gonna be filled with uh, imagery, right? Of, of a creaky, old, decrepit, desolate hermit shack, right? All those words are not words you'd wanna to use to describe your own house, right? You'd say, oh, I live in a nice, cheery, cozy, comfortable, warm house, right? So you see where I'm getting at with that? We read a spooky story, right? You get a lot of these weird words in there, the connotation, thinking of something dark, thinking of something bad. 
But if you're describing maybe a Christmas story, right? You wake up on Christmas morning, you come downstairs, it's nice and warm by the fireplace. You look, you want to open your presents, you have anticipation, right? Your words that you use will be positive, okay? So unsavory uh, comes from to savor something, to enjoy, generally associated with food. People will say uh, sweet and savory, like a nice a juicy cheeseburger would be very savory, right? So if something is unsavory, it's the same way, the opposite. Uh, I, it's unappetizing, I don't want it, um, I wouldn't want to, you taste something, it's, oh, it's very unsavory, right? We're not interested in that, okay? So a lot of these words, uh, something you've heard before, they have a little bit of negative connotation to them, that's kind of what ties this list together as I, as I kind of grouped them up for you. And we'll try to do that as we move into the next stories and the next chapters, we'll try to group the words together with something that has uh, an overall theme or something we can really start to understand, okay? So take a look at the words, write them down. Um, you can use them in a sentence. It doesn't have to be the same sentence I used. It can be anything, right? And just make sure uh, you're spelling them properly. We will have the, the list is on your sheet and it'll also be below, okay? So again, 315, it's 315stories.com, link below. It's gonna be that little password box that opens up. And the password to find out the thrilling conclusion, I hope, of our buried treasure story is hook, right? So you'll go to hook. So put that in, find out. I'm gonna do the same right now. Tomorrow, um, we can talk about it a little bit. You can go ahead and write um, a reaction to this, a reaction to the audio file, a reaction to my uh, wonderful storytelling, of course, and then a reaction to the thrilling video conclusion. Uh, put it as a written reflection in your journals. Go ahead and get started on the worksheets. Make sure you are checking the germination progress and the rate of growth in millimeters on your plants. And if you have any questions, go ahead and comment below or send me an email, slags2 at gmail.com. All right, you guys have a great day and I'll see you tomorrow morning.